Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. Good to be with you. Somebody said last week, I always give a special welcome to those of you who are online. Not a special welcome to those of you here. So special welcome to those of you who are online with us. So when we lived in Atlanta, we had this house that we lived in for seven, eight years when we were there. We loved this house. And shortly after we moved in, we started to learn all the things we needed to do to kind of fix up the house. And one of those projects was a siding project. We had this uh, short uh, one-story ranch house, and one side of the house needed new siding. It was a side that didn't get a whole lot of sun, and some water had like soaked up in the siding, so it was this like old press board siding that you could just like peel off the side of the house with your hand. So I ended up calling some contractors, got them to come give quotes, and their quotes were like way higher than I was anticipating they should be, like $4,000 for one side of the house, $7,000. I was like, either I'm way off on my calculation of what things cost, or they are just overpricing this because they don't want to do this job, which may have been the case. So I was was talking to this guy at our church about this, just saying like I was way underestimating what these things were going to cost. And he said, hey, I have a small little construction company. Do you want me to come and bid out the job? I was like, yes, please. So he comes over to the house and we walk around the house and show him the project. And usually when somebody is giving you a quote, they like take measurements They do all of these things, they go back home, they look up projects, they do calculations, and then they send you a quote maybe a day or two later. We're standing there in the back of the house, and he's looking at it, and he kind of goes like this, and takes out a tape measure, measures one or two things, and he goes, how does $1,500 sound? And I was like, what? I was like, can you put that in writing for me? It's like, yeah, $1,500. And instantly I'm thinking, like, even if he does a really bad job and I have to pay him to redo the job, it's still cheaper than every other quote I got. And in that moment, I was like, I knew he was going to be my go-to handyman for as long as we lived in that house. And he was. He did all kinds of projects for us. He did windows. He uh, rebuilt a retaining wall. He put a French drain in. He did our shower and our bathroom, all kinds of things. And he was an amazing guy, not just because he did good work, but because he like, really cared about the people he worked for. Like, he would stop by from time to time and just check on things. He would stop by when I had a question, and he would like, just do things for free. And he was just this all-around good guy. And, and he also loved gardening. He, he was a great gardener. He had like, huge gardens in his backyard. And one day he stopped by our house, and I had been trimming this bush in our front yard uh, just to try and like contain it. It was getting over big, getting too big, and I like absolutely butchered the thing. So he comes over to check on something. We're standing at our front step as he's getting about to leave, and he looks down at this bush and he's like, "What happened to this bush?" <laughs> and I was like, "It was me. I, I did it." So we're talking a little bit more about his job and things we were working on. And somewhere along the way, he says, you know, I'll work with anybody. I'll work with anybody. But but there's two people I would never hire. And I was like, oh, really? Who's that? And he's like, this one guy from our church named Charlie. And I was like, oh, yeah, I could see I wouldn't hire Charlie either. And I was like, just out of curiosity, who's the other guy? He's like, you. (laughs) With what you did to that bush, like, you're never getting a job with me. It's like, fair enough. Fair enough. And so he was just an all-around amazing guy. Took care, um, like, like really connected well with our kids and was like this consummate grandfather to everybody. So in November of 2021, he came down with COVID. And he battled COVID for a few weeks in his house. And then on December 3rd, he went into the hospital. And I remember getting a text from, from, from some friends of ours in Atlanta saying, Kevin is in the hospital with covid pray. And so for for two weeks, we prayed and prayed and prayed, crossed over into the middle part of December, and got another text a few days later that Kevin went home to be with the Lord on December 17th. The, The irony of that day was that was the same day that I came down with COVID, and my experience with COVID was was very different than his. And I've been thinking about Kevin a lot, because one of the things that we're going to do this summer while I'm on sabbatical is go down to Atlanta go visit our friends down there, go visit our old church, and we're going to see lots of people. We're going to see lots of old friends, reconnect with lots of people, but I've been thinking Kevin won't be there. 
And one of the last memories I have of Kevin is him making these huge trophies for this thing we were doing at our church. Uh, we had this like fall festival thing with a pie eating contest and a chili cook off. And so he made these two trophies that were like literally five feet tall, these big gold painted things with a golden spatula on top and a golden spoon on top. And he took great pride and joy in these things. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if while we're there, I, I see them somewhere around the church. So I've been thinking a lot about Kevin and how we, we won't get to see him when we're down there. And I, I imagine there, there's many of us who are here this morning who are in a place where they're grieving the loss of someone or something. Gr grief is a common experience that we all have. And many of us are probably familiar with the five stages of grief, right? There's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally we get to a place of acceptance. And we typically think that it's a linear process. Maybe there's some ups and downs, but you kind of move through these five stages and it looks a little something like this. But anybody who's really worked through grief knows that grief isn't that linear. It actually looks like this. It is one big hot mess and you can be all over the place for an extended period of time. And my guess is many of us are here this morning maybe on the heels of that, or maybe you're in that, like that mess is like, that's me today. Or maybe in this last year you have lost someone and it's just still lingering with you. Maybe the grief isn't as palpable as it once was, but it's still there. And so the question that often surfaces is in the midst of grief, like, what do I do? Like, how do I get through this? How do I make sense of life? And our passage this morning speaks to that reality. It speaks to the reality of what you do in order to help move you through your stages of grief. And this is what our passage says. This is 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 13. Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed. Now, one of the things that Paul repeats through his letter is this phrase, you know. You see it nine times. You know. He'll say, you know this, you know that. And oftentimes when he uses the phrase, you know, he's referring to either things that he did, the way that he lived while he was with them in Thessalonica, or things that he taught them. Which means a good portion of this letter is Paul simply reminding those in Thessalonica of things they already know. But once we get to this passage in chapter 4, we see that Paul really is now trying to teach them something new. You could even say this is the reason why Paul wrote this letter in the first place, this passage today. Because once you finish this passage and you cross over into chapter 5, you see the phrase, you know, again. You see it at the beginning of chapter 4. You see it at the beginning of chapter 5. But in the middle of chapter 4, you see a different word. It's the only time he uses this word through this letter. He uses the word uninformed. He says, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed, meaning we want to teach you something new. And the thing he's looking to teach them is this. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Which raises a question like of all the things, all the new things that he could teach them about what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus, why does he teach them about those who are, as he says, asleep in death? Well, most likely this is in response to the report that Timothy brings back to Paul. We read in chapter 3 that Paul is worried and wondering about how the Thessalonians are doing, so he sends Timothy to check on them, and then he comes back. In chapter 3, we have, here's what Timothy brought back after visiting you. He said that they have great memories of you being there, Paul. They are standing firm in their faith. They're loving each other well, but there are those in the community who are distressed with grief. Because maybe even since Paul last visited them, there are members of that community who have died. And they're not just grieving over the death of a loved one, but with their newfound faith, they're now distressed, and they're wrestling with the question, what happens when Jesus returns? 
what happens when Jesus comes back. Because as you read through the New Testament, there seems to be this expectation of the first century Christians that the return of Jesus was going to be immediate. Like some of them seem to expect that it was going to happen in their lifetime. I mean, even when Jesus was with the disciples in Acts chapter 1, before he ascends back to the Father, before he leaves, the disciples who are with him ask the question, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Like, are you going to do it right now? They had this expectation. Jesus died. He came back to life. This is going to culminate right now. And Jesus is like, see ya. I'm out. I'll be back later. And away he goes, right? So for those first century Christians, they're assuming, well, within our lifetime, he is going, he's not going to be gone that long. Like, he'll be back soon. And many of them were awaiting in their life that he would return. So for those in Thessalonica who had lost loved ones before Jesus came back, the question was, well, what happens to them? Are they going to miss out on what Jesus has in store for them? So their grief is compounded by this distress of their loved ones that have passed. And so Paul is writing specifically to give those who are in grief a sense of hope. This is what he says. We're writing to you so you won't be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Now, the previous section, right before, the passage right before this passage, Paul is talking about what makes believers distinct from the rest of the world. And one of those distinctive characteristics is the hope that we have, specifically hope with regards to death. And biblical hope isn't lofty optimism. It's not the power of positive thinking. It's not wishful thinking. Biblical hope is a sense of certainty, specifically certainty on the trajectory of history, that history is headed somewhere, that it will all culminate when Jesus returns. And when Jesus returns, the thing that he will do is set all things right. Everything that is wrong will be right made right. Everything that is broken will be restored. And so we have hope that in the death and the, 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 the decay that we experience now, Jesus will come into that and make it all new. And as a pastor, you end up confronting the reality of death a lot. Sometimes the first person that an individual calls when they've lost somebody is their pastor or the church office. Sometimes we are the front row, the first responders to the death of a loved one. And when you're younger, you're like, oh, I've got answers to this. I can figure this out. The more and more you see death in the life of a congregation, you're like, I have no answers. I, I don't know why this happened. I, I can give you no clarity. Because Paul says in Romans 8 that all creation groans. And you realize, I'm not immune to that groaning as well. And I don't know if you've ever been to a funeral of somebody who's an unbeliever and been to a funeral of somebody who is a follower of Jesus, but you find that there's two very different undercurrents of emotion at those. There's always grief. Like, loss is always hard. There is always grief. But in a funeral where somebody has hope in Jesus Christ, that they have this belief that Jesus is returning, and when he returns, he will make all things new. There's this undercurrent of hope that this isn't the end, that this isn't my final experience of the loss of this person. But then you go to a funeral with people who have no hope. The undercurrent there is despair. Like, how do I make it through this day? How do I make it through tomorrow? Like, how do I make it through the rest of my life without this person there? The undercurrent, the emotional undercurrent of those two scenarios, while the situations are the same, are very different. Because one has hope. The other one is stuck in despair. And what Paul is doing here for these Christians who have lost loved ones, who are wrestling, well, what happens when Jesus returns? He gives them a sense of hope specifically in three things. The first is the resurrection 
of Jesus Christ. He says this in verse 14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. See, all the hope we have as followers of Jesus hinges on the resurrection. Without the resurrection, we have nothing. Maybe Jesus died for our sins on the cross, great, but without a resurrection, big whoop, death still wins. And Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if the resurrection isn't true, our preaching is useless. If the resurrection isn't true, all of Jesus' miracles, his kindness, his teaching, all of that is pointless. If the resurrection isn't true, our faith is useless, we're still in our sins, and we, as followers of Jesus, are the most of all people to be pitied because we believe something that isn't true. But, because it is true, validated by those who were eyewitnesses, who saw Jesus hang on the cross, who saw him put in a grave, and saw him come out of the grave to say, he has defeated death. He has raised to new life, and therefore, we have wild, audacious, outrageous hope that one day, those who have died before us will rise again. And Paul is teaching here that we are united with Christ. That, that's his phrase, a common phrase he uses to talk about our relationship with Christ. He says, we are united with Christ. We are in Christ, is his term. He'll say it again in verse 16. We are in him, which is kind of a weird thing to be in somebody else, right? So like, how do you explain that? How do you illustrate that? We have this little figurine, and it's like, okay, this little figurine, this is, I, I pulled it from the children's ministry area. This represents you this morning, and you put it in something, right? And what happens to this cup happens to the thing in it. If it goes up, the thing in it goes up. If it goes down, it goes down. If I were to submerge it underwater, it would go underwater, which is like, great. Now, you can't see what's in there, right? Which, maybe that is encouraging, thinking like we're in Jesus, but maybe we're just kind of mysteriously unseen. But I think a, a better way to illustrate this is that we are in Jesus, and can be seen, meaning it's not as though you lose your identity of who you are in Jesus. You are in Jesus, and when God looks at Jesus, because you can see the cup, right? That, you can answer. That's not a rhetorical question. You can see the cup, right? <laughs> and say, yes, Brian, we can see the cup. Good. You're with me. I can tell. This is great. You can also see the figurine, right? Yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> can you see the figurine in this cup? Great. Good. Whew. We are cooking on all cylinders now. So you can see the figurine and you can see the cup. When we are in Jesus, God sees us and sees Jesus because we are united with him. Which means when Jesus rose again for those who have placed their faith and confidence in him, you too, you've already risen. Did you know that? Like you have already risen from the grave. You, you will not make it to the end of your life unscathed by death, but you have already risen from the grave because what's true of Jesus for those who have been united to him is true of you as well. And that gives us wild, audacious hope. Paul is saying the resurrection of Jesus means we too one, one day will rise again. Since death couldn't defeat Jesus, we have confidence that it won't defeat us either. And therefore, we don't have to be distressed. We will grieve about those who have passed away, but we don't have to be distressed because when Jesus returns, Paul says, Jesus will have them with him. And then he goes on to say this about what it will be like, what will happen when Jesus returns. Verse 15, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, we who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ, there's that term again, will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, there's been a lot of speculation, a lot of theological speculation about this passage. Like, where, will there really be, when Jesus comes back, this disembodied voice that's just shouting from the mountaintops, 
all over the entire globe and everybody will hear the same thing? Will there really be this blast of a brass symphony of these trumpet blasts everywhere? Will we really be caught up in the air and float away and just disappear? I have no idea. I really don't. Some speculate that what Paul is doing here is he's taking allusions from the Old Testament, specifically in Exodus when the Israelites are at Mount Sinai, a few references specifically from Psalm 47, trying to describe and make this connection to the Old Testament. These things also might literally happen. We might hear a loud voice. We might hear trumpet blasts. We might just be swept up into the sky. I don't know. But what's interesting about what Paul is saying in this moment. His basis for saying these things is the very beginning of verse 15. He says, according to the Lord's word. See, not only has Jesus risen from the dead, but our hope is also that God has given us his word. He has given us his word in the sense of a written word that we can read and understand the story of who he is and what he has done. But in that written word, he has given us his promises. He has given us the promise that he will return in the same way that he rose again. We have this hope in these promises. Uh, Earlier this week, I was talking to one of my daughters um, about what was going to happen the next day. My mom picks up our kids a couple days after school and takes them to her house, and then I go get them and do whatever we need to do for the rest of the night. And um, we're in spring soccer season, so I have to get on Tuesday one daughter from my mom's house to soccer practice. In the last couple weeks, we've been like three minutes late. Not too bad, in my opinion, but she does not like to be late. So it's Monday night, and I'm like, okay, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to pick you up at Mimi's. And she's like, Dad, you're going to be there on time. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get there at 5. She's like, you're going to be there on time. I'm like, yes, I will be there on time. She goes, do you promise? And then I hesitated. <laughs> like, like, one of the things we're trying to teach this daughter is about what it means to be flexible. Like, people can make promises, but sometimes we don't always follow through on our promises because sometimes things happen out of our control. And I'm in this moment of hesitation, and she goes, do you promise? And I said, look, sweetie, there is only one person who can always make good on their promises, trying to refer to God, like God is the only one. And she rolls her eyes and says, do you promise? And I was like, yes, kissed her on the head, good night. I was like trying to have a like theological lesson with her and all she cared about was soccer practice the next day. But as I was in that moment of hesitating, like I found myself like interestingly encouraged that God is the only one who will keep his promises, who can keep his promises, who does keep his promises, and says he will return again. And so we can take that to the bank, trusting that in the same way he rose from the grave, the same way that he ascended to the Father, he will return. And those who have fallen asleep in him, he will have all of them with him, and we will be caught up together with them forever. But notice what he says at the end of this passage. Notice who he says we will be with when he does return. He he doesn't say all those people who have fallen asleep in death before Jesus returns, when Jesus comes back, we will be with those people. No, he says, and we will be with the Lord forever. Our hope is that Jesus has risen from the grave. And that in the same way that he rose, we too will rise again. We have hope that he has given us his word, that he has given us his promise that he will return to make all things new. And we have this hope that we will be with not the people who have passed, although that will be a great reunion for those who have also put their confidence in him, but we will be with the Lord forever. It's a little Sandlot reference for those of you who remember Sandlot. Forever. The hope that we have in Christ is him. He is our hope. At the beginning, Paul is saying, we don't want you to be uninformed. But Paul really isn't trying to teach them new content here. Rather, he's trying to instill a sense of hope in them. The purpose of this passage primarily isn't for only Paul to give them a sense of hope, but it's to help them 
encourage each other and give each other a sense of hope. Because this is how he finishes verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, encouraging one another doesn't mean you dismiss people's grief and say, hey, 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 don't be sad about losing people because Jesus is going to return and they're going to be with them. Sometimes people use this unnecessarily to dismiss people's grief because they don't want to deal with other people's grief. It's okay to grieve, and it's okay to be sad. Paul says, but we grieve not like people without hope. We grieve as people who have hope. And maybe you're here this morning, and you're in a place of grief. Maybe you've lost a loved one in the recent past or in this past year. Or maybe you're here this morning, and you're not dealing with grief of somebody you've lost, but just grief of a different scenario of some kind. What Paul is trying to say with this passage, regardless of whether your grief is about somebody who has passed or some other loss, he's trying to say that it's hope in Jesus that heals a grieving heart. But hope in Jesus heals a grieving heart. And when you see that someone else has that hope, when you're in a place of not having hope, it can be wildly encouraging to say, can I borrow some of your hope? Can I, can I borrow the faith that you have because I am depleted of it today? I know intellectually that this is true, but some days it just isn't there in my gut. So Paul's saying, encourage one another. Encourage one another with the hope that you have, not dismissing their grief or glossing over it, but sitting in it with them to give them a sense of one day, maybe today's not that day, but one day Jesus will return and make all things new. And we hold on to that. We cling to it. Whoever wrote Hebrews says it's an anchor for our soul. So if you're here this morning and you're grieving loss, be encouraged. Take heart. Take hope with you that Jesus, he sees you in your pain. And because you have been united with him, God, who raised him from the dead, will also raise you and those who have gone before us who have placed their faith in him as well. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the power of your word. We thank you so much for what it means for us and our perspective on eternity and the, our perspective on the rest of this life. And so, Lord, today, we just say thank you. We say thank you for your word. We say thank you for the testimony that we're about to hear about those who have also placed their hope in you. And may we be wildly encouraged by the words of others of what you have done in their life as well. Amen.